Cast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to the CFN webinar series for November 13th. Uh, today's presentation is called Making Sense with Families in Long-Term Care, a Knowledge to Action Study. And the presenter today will be Dr. Jennifer Baumbush uh, from the University of British Columbia. Uh, my name is Ananda Lorbergs, and I will be the host of today's webinar. Uh, as many of you know, what we'll do is uh, after the presentation, we'll get through um, as many questions as time permits. And uh, so feel free to submit those questions um, even during the presentation as we'll only get to them at the end, but feel free to enter them um, throughout if you, as you think of them. There is a reminder of a survey um, that will come up after the webinar. So let us know how we're doing, what we can do better. Uh, this is important feedback to help improve our webinar series. And lastly, we will have these uh, slides and video and audio available on our website within a day or two usually. So check back if you'd like to rewatch it or send it to a colleague. We have a, uh, a few couple webinars coming up um, next, no, two weeks from now. Uh, on the November 27th, we'll have Paul Stoley from the University of Waterloo. Um, and then on December 4th, we have um, Kelly Stajdahar um, and colleagues uh, from out west um, who will be presenting at that lunchtime webinar. So keep an eye out. Keep uh, We'll have emails going out about those as well. So you can put them in your calendars. Um, a little CFN announcement, uh, specifically for the training programs. So the uh, LOI stage has closed uh, for the fellowships and summer students. So now um, we will have the deadline for the full application packages for the 2020 uh, round is on Monday, December the 16th uh, by noon. So keep that uh, date handy if that applies to you. Uh, only those who have submitted an intent to apply uh, are eligible to submit the full application package. Okay, so now we I will introduce our presenter, Dr. Jennifer Baumbush, um, and she is an associate professor in the School of Nursing at the University of British Columbia. She received a PhD and uh, her Bachelor of Science in Nursing uh, from UBC and also a Master's of Science in Nursing from the University of Western Ontario. Her research focuses on improving the inclusion of families in long-term care homes. So at this point, we're gonna hand it over to Jennifer um, and you can go ahead with your presentation. Great, thanks, Amanda. Um, I'd like to start by thanking CFN for having me do this webinar today and be able to share a research adventure with everyone. And I'd like to acknowledge the co-investigators on the study who are listed there on the slide. And I also want to thank the participants. This was a study that required a bit of commitment from our participants. Um, and so we really appreciated that. And I'd also like to thank the leadership at the site that we were at, because any time that as researchers we enter a long term care home and um, are going to be shifting or disrupting how things are going there, particularly through increasing family engagement, that's something that takes a lot of courage on the part of leadership. Uh, to allow us to do that. So that was um, a really wonderful part on their part, um, as I'll discuss as we kind of move forward in what actually unfolded over the study. So, oh, there we go. So the agenda for the next little bit that we'll be spending together, uh, I'm going to talk about what is the knowledge to be translated and how will it be translated. I think these are two really key aspects when you're doing knowledge translation research and you need to be really clear uh, as a researcher what you're doing and those are the two aspects. There's the knowledge and then the how. Um, I'll talk about the purpose and research objectives of the study, the study procedures, the results, and then some of the methodological lessons learned and the discussion implications. So first of all, what was the knowledge to be translated? So uh, the Alzheimer's Society of Canada has a wonderful document called Rising Tide. And uh, they estimated that by 2038, families will be contributing over 100 million hours of care work in long-term care homes in Canada. That's a substantial amount of work. 
And sometimes there's a bit of a myth that families abandon their relatives when they move into a long-term care home, and that's largely untrue. People who have been in intensive caregiving situations before they move into a long-term care home, they continue their caregiving after that relative moves in. It changes a bit because they're not perhaps in most cases providing as much what we would call hands-on care, but they're still present. Um, but even though this is the case, literature and research about families in care facilities is pretty consistent. It shows that the family role is fairly ambiguous. There aren't a lot of formal ways in which families are included. And so this makes them largely invisible. And this becomes problematic in many ways. Families report feeling excluded from decision making and really unsure of how they can contribute and what the boundaries are with staff roles. And many of them have negative experiences that lead to poor mental health outcomes. And it doesn't just affect the family members, it affects the quality of care for residents and it can also affect staff. So we have published a fairly recent literature review on this topic and you can find it in the Journal of Family Nursing in the first issue of 2018 if you'd like to read more about sort of our approach to shifting from family involvement to family inclusion. The other place that the knowledge for the study came from was a four year CIHR funded study, which we called inviting dialogue on experiences of active involvement in long term care or the ideal study. This was a critical ethnography and it took place in three care homes in British Columbia. And I've included the website there uh, that you can go to from our research unit and we have plain language reports for all three sites there. And what you'll see is that very much what we learned in those uh, different sites supported what was already known in the literature. And we also found that long-term care is evolving. People, the residents are staying there for a shorter period of time. Uh, they're moving in more sick, more complex. Many have dementia. So whereas the role of families in this setting maybe 15 or 20 years ago, very much was supporting the socio-emotional health of residents is changing and they are becoming more hands-on. And so these are leading to additional complexities that we heard from the families in the study really needed to be addressed. And so that's what led to the SENSE study and this intervention study that we did and that we created with families. So that was a knowledge to be translated. Then we had to think about how will this knowledge be translated? And so we looked at the intervention research with families in long-term care homes and found out that it's really limited. So lots of us as researchers go and look at what's happening and examining this situation, but that hasn't translated really well into intervention research. And I think part of that is because families are very transient in this, in this setting. And it's different than doing an intervention with staff. With staff, you can say, okay, everybody, we're doing a workshop today and we'll pay you and everybody shows up and you have coverage, hopefully, so people can attend the workshops and you can do it that way. But families are sort of their own leaders. And so capturing them within an intervention is quite a different type of way to approach things. Um, and so we found also that in a lot of this intervention research, families were more of an outcome measure, so they weren't directly involved in the intervention. So we decided uh, to try um, a more of a knowledge translation approach and employ a collaborative approach in which the intervention was co-constructed with family members to see what, what would work for them and help them and have them co-lead the development of the actual intervention. So what is SENSE? Uh, this is around support, education, networking, and sustained engagement. So what we heard really clearly from the families in our ideal study was that those were the things they wanted. They wanted support and not necessarily support from families, but peer support. And how do you create uh, the environment for that to take place. They were hungry for education. A lot of them had attended Alzheimer's Society of Canada and their 
provincial and territorial workshops when their relatives still lived at home. But they really wanted education about what is dementia look like in the advanced stages? What is our life about now? What is our relationship about now? And we're looking for education around that. The networking piece also had to do with families. How do you learn from each other? It's not just about support, but actually building a network. And then sustained engagement so that it wasn't just coming together once, but how do you build something where people um, actually foster relationships with each other? So that is what SENSE is all about. So the purpose and the research objectives then that carried out from that was, as I said, to pilot a collaborative knowledge translation intervention with families. The research objectives were to identify key areas for education, peer support and networking for families, develop, implement and evaluate a series of workshops that were co-created and delivered by family members and clinicians, and assess the impact of the SENSE workshops on knowledge about issues in long-term care and sense of involvement in care. So this was the fairly convoluted study procedures that we came up with. Um, and so if you look at the figure, what it shows is that we intended to have three workshops. So before we even started uh, the workshop, we needed to do a pre-survey and I'll describe that shortly. Then we had what we called a workshop development day where as researchers, clinicians and family members, we came together and looked at the results of the survey and said, well, what should this workshop series look like in terms of content and in terms of delivery? Then we had one of those workshop development days in between each workshop. And we also did focus groups and team debriefings with the people who attended the workshops. And at the very end, we did a post survey. So that involved a lot of data and a lot of moving pieces. So on the left hand side, as you can see, we did pre and post surveys. We did workshop debriefing interviews. We did participant observation and field notes of both the workshops and the workshop development sessions. And we interviewed the workshop development team members because there isn't a lot in the literature around co-design, co-creation, co-construction, whichever word you choose with family members in this setting. So we use this as an opportunity to do some methodological uh, scholarship as well. I'm not gonna be presenting those particular results today. That was a, its own kettle of fish, as they say. It was very interesting to see, and we learned a lot about even that process of uh, co-creating with families. So those are the study procedures, that sort of high level picture of them. So in terms of the study timeline, we did the pre-surveys in the winter, sort of December, January, February in 2016-17. The actual workshop series took place across April and May in 2017. We did the workshops every two weeks. So we would do a workshop and then have a week in between where we could debrief and the following week Jennifer, we can't hear you anymore. I'm just going to ask you to just check your microphone maybe or if there's something that was changed on your screen as soon as you just before you switched over to the slide we lost you. Um, you're we still completed on. the post survey. Oh, is it okay to keep going? Yeah, yeah it's better oh, now. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, the post survey, 19 people completed that, eight of whom had attended the workshops and 11 who hadn't. And then four family members participated on the workshop development team. So I'm just gonna move into now what we learned from the pre-workshop survey. So um, we sent out 82 pre-workshop surveys. So as a reminder, this was a 90 bed facility of which 82 of the residents had an identified family, primary family member contact. So there were some residents who did not have a family member contact listed um, in their file. So we mailed those out and we followed a sort of a abbreviated Dillman's approach. We uh, sent out the survey, we included a small token of appreciation, a $5 coffee card, we did a follow-up letter, we did where it was possible follow-up 
phone calls to in order to maximize the response rate. So we did end up getting back 36 usable surveys. And this part of the survey was really comprised of three sections. There was a socio-demographic information about uh, the participants. We included the family involvement um, and importance of family involvement scale. And then we had um, uh, several questions around workshop preferences. So in terms of those 36 people who completed the original uh, pre-survey, the majority were retired. Uh, but we also had a lot who worked full time and that was an important piece of this. Um, it's a fairly well educated group. Uh, we had more women than men, which wasn't overly surprising given what we know about family caregiving. And they were tended to be in the middle to older age range. In terms of their relationship to the residents, it was again fairly evenly spread between children and spouses and then some other types of relationships were listed. The resident's uh, main diagnosis, not surprising, was dementia. So we asked people, what is that main reason why you say, would say that they are living in a care home? And it was uh, dementia. And um, again, fairly even between the resident's gender and many were uh, very much in the older years, around 80 and a, then a bit above and a bit below that. So the next section was a family involvement and importance of family involvement scale. I really like this scale. There aren't too many scales around uh, this topic um, that exist. And this is one by Reed Chapel and Gish and Dr. Colin Reed was part of our research team. And why I like this scale is because it asks people to rate both what is present in the facility and is this important to me? And I think that this is really valuable because a lot of times staff and leaders and uh, clinical leads can run around thinking, what are we going to do? You know, what are we going to focus on for quality improvement even? And I think it's really important to ask people, do we have this and is it important to you? So why focus on things that maybe are present but aren't important or aren't present but aren't important? So this scale captures that and I really like that about it. So some of the sample statements that people are asked is, I feel like I'm involved in decision making about my family member's care when he or she cannot make decisions for themselves. Administrators have asked my opinions about the quality of care provided at this facility. I feel comfortable phoning staff members and talking to them about how my family member is doing. Those are really practical types of statements that as a care home, you would be able to look at where are we doing well and where could we improve and what's important as an area for our families for us to improve in. Um, so we had people complete that scale and what we found was that there was a significant gap between family members actual involvement and their perceived importance of involvement in their relatives care. So there were lots of areas to target uh, around where we could narrow that gap and where the facility could say we could target this as a QI project um, and improve area, the way that families are involved in this way and that would match up better with what's important to them. Again, this is beyond the scope of this presentation, but I wanted to put this here so that people might take this up as a project in care homes they're working with to be able to do some very targeted types of QI with families there. So there are lots of ways in which this scale could be used. But definitely it confirmed for us that this was a good setting for our study uh, where there was room for improvement around that lineup between how families saw as opportunities to be involved and what was important to them. The last part of the workshop uh, pre-survey was looking at um, you know, what was the workshop content that people wanted. So of uh, the 32 respondents, uh, 32 of the people who filled out the survey expressed an interest in attending the workshop series. And what we had done in these questions was we listed various areas that had come up in our deal study and then had an open-ended question. So aside from these, is there, are there other topics? And we got lots and lots, copious amounts of feedback on this question. But uh, when we came together as a workshop development team, it really uh, sort of came down to these three areas. 
um, communication with staff about resident care was clearly the most important to the family members. Then after that, understanding the progression of dementia. And then after that was managing responsive behaviors. So it's important to understand that this was a facility. It did not have a secure locked unit uh, for what we would consider a special care unit as a used to be and sometimes they're still called. So people with fairly advanced dementia are living together in very much a congregate kind of setting a lot of the time. And so family members were observing those responsive behaviors and wanted to learn more about, you know, what do we do in these situations? So those were the three content areas. We also asked people about their preferred time for the workshops um, and the consensus was really to have it on a weekday morning. So that's how we landed on doing it during the day. So now I'm going to talk about the workshop series itself. So this was really the overview of how we spent our time together during those workshops from about 9.30 to 10. We had registration and just general mingling. Then from 10 to 12 was actually the workshop where education and support happened. And then we offered people, um, if they wanted to stay, they could stay for lunch and networking afterwards. And we catered lunch with sandwiches and things like that. And I think that what was interesting and I guess not overly surprising was people stayed a really long time afterwards for the lunch and the networking piece, which I think was a really lovely aspect of what unfolded and what we weren't necessarily really expecting. So on the left hand side, you can see that this is the flyer that we posted and we sent out to all the family members. So in terms of the people who participated, we had 11 family members who attended the workshops. Initially, we had said, if you register, we want you to attend all three. That didn't happen. Those were best laid plans and that doesn't work with people's lives, people's interests uh, and you know, the realities of what happened for families over the course of the study. So we did have five uh, family members who attended all three workshops. We had five who attended two workshops and we had one who attended one. And if you look at the uh, demographics of this particular group, not surprising, most of them were retired because of the time of the day. Um, we had more women than men attend and uh, most were spouses. And again, that linked to their employment status because most of the children were working. And again, all of the people who attended reported that their relative's main diagnosis was dementia. I'm gonna briefly go through what happened in each of the three workshops because that was part of the data that we gathered. So this, we gathered data before and after, but also all throughout the middle. I wanted to highlight the physical layout for the workshop. So when um, we were actually in that 10 to 12 period of time, we all sat in a circle. We intermixed the researchers and the family members and clinicians, and we all sat together. Uh, for the second and third workshops, we did have a bit of PowerPoint um, just to be able to keep our conversations on track a little bit. But overall, we tried to maintain that circle feeling. We then had sort of a kitchen area where we could sit and have the snacks before and afterwards. So in terms of what we talked about in that first workshop, it was the who and what's of communication. It was clear that that was a topic people really wanted to know more about. Some about the legal framework for decision making and where family members come in in British Columbia in terms of making decisions around their relatives health. Um, the other area that was really important was the concerns and complaints ladder. Where do I go? Who do I talk to if something's happening? Uh, and how do I take that up, up the ladder, so to speak, when my concerns aren't addressed? And then also additional resources for advocates. For each of the workshops, we asked people, what did you like best and how could it go differently? So this was from the first workshop, some of the feedback. And I won't read off every single one, but I think what the big takeaway for us was really finding a balance between people sharing their experiences and providing that educational content. And that was a theme that carried all the way through that we are working on finding out how do we do that? How do we find that balance? And a lot of that depends on the people who are present and how much they feel like they need to tell their story. And it was clear we had people in our group who felt they needed to tell their story over and over and over again and that was helping them but for other people that wasn't as much of an interest it was also really 
interesting to see that people appreciated looking at what are areas for systemic reform? How do we move beyond, I'm not happy with how the laundry's being done or what's on that you know, tray of food, to what are some of the bigger structural and systemic issues happening in the long-term care system that are creating this situation that we see every day? And so people really appreciated getting, sort of elevating the conversation and looking at those issues. Um, and then also people really enjoyed the lunchtime afterwards and just getting to chat with each other in uh, unstructured time. But this happened after they had gotten to know each other in the group. So as we often see in other kinds of situations in the beforehand time, people didn't chit chat very much with each other, but after they had spent two hours together in a group, they were highly engaged during the lunchtime. And then what could be improved again, people wanted to see sort of have that balance between stories and practical information. They wanted more sort of formal education time with the researchers and clinicians. One of the really important things that people pointed out was for some of them, the information that we shared, particularly around who's who on the staff, uh, what is that complaints letter, that would have been really helpful orientation information at the, you know, when their relative moved in. And for some of them, they had had their relative living in the care facility for a period of time, and that wasn't as useful for them. So also thinking about what's the continuum of that caregiver journey in a long-term care home and where are different pieces of information useful. So our second workshop, we thought, okay, well, we're gonna step up the practical, uh, more education focused, and we got into the pieces framework. So this was um, a very interesting part where we were very much about sort of imparting that education knowledge piece. It might have been a little bit too much. Uh, again, we are constantly looking for that uh, balance, but um, fortunately we had a very skilled clinician doing the teaching and I think that it was really helpful for families, especially that center circle, because that was one of the things that family members clearly really wanted was language for how, what questions do we even ask when someone says to us your relative has changed or this has happened, and when I say someone I mean a staff member, that they had the language to ask the questions. They might not know everything in the outer circle, but having those questions in the inner circle were really, really key for family members. So we also talked a little bit about shifting from medical to relational care in this setting and what that meant and the implications of that. Some of uh, the topic was around medications because that was a big concern for family members. We hear a lot about um, chemical restraints in the news and how medications are used in care facilities. And they just want to know, like, what does all that mean? How do I help make an informed decision around that for my relative? And also talking about the later stage of dementia and what that looks like. Because again, that is where their relatives were at and that's what they really wanted to know. At this point, we changed our feedback sheet. Um, it was a wonderful suggestion from one of our team members, uh, Dr. Kathy Ward-Griffin. And it's a really simple evaluation called two stars and a wish. And it worked really well. And it was just a way of saying, what were two things I liked and what would I like next time? So this is just the highlight again from the feedback. Some people really loved that sharing of personal experiences and some people did not. Um, and so that again was a balance that we we're always looking for. They really appreciated having excellent and appropriate information from experts. So having actual expert clinicians come in and give the information was really helpful. Um, and it also helped them understand why certain things were happening in the care plan. And I think that's a really important um, aspect to take away that um, having that understanding that education helped them and really helped avoid some conflict with staff when people when staff would come and say things had changed um, having that knowledge and understanding was really good so again some of the wishes was just sort of having the facilitator ensure that some family members didn't take over the conversation people wanted more time a longer workshop I certainly think that the content from this workshop could have been spread over several sessions. Um, and so, of course, it was difficult to take in all that information. So this was our third workshop um, where we focused on making moments meaningful. And one of the things that came up a lot for people was, you know, once my relative is in that advanced stage, they may or may not be talking that much anymore. They may or may not recognize me anymore. They may or may not be independently mobile. 
what do I do when I come to spend time with them? What does that time look like? I don't know what to do with that time. So um, we had recently in our research team done a literature review on non-pharmacological interventions in advanced dementia. So we presented some of that data and some of that research to people around ideas, focusing around art and music uh, and just spending time together over food if that was possible. And then we also invited family members to talk about what they had done that was successful and they really enjoyed that. And one of the family members brought along um, photograph uh, posters that they had created with their relative. And it was also a way to communicate with staff to say, this is who my relative is. This is what's been important to them in their life. And we spent time sharing those experiences. We also talked about the importance of going outside and that just taking someone outside for some fresh air is so important because that's something oftentimes staff are not able to do. So that is a place where family members can really make a difference in terms of enriching their relative's life. We also talked a bit about um, taking care of the caregiver. So as you can imagine, the people who chose to attend these sessions were people who were very regularly at the facility. And we talked about self-care and what they were doing for themselves. And a lot of that is also just saying that's okay. That's okay to take good care of yourself too. Um, and so people shared what they were individually doing in that way. And you can see afterwards, this was our lunch table. I think we all stayed there till about two o'clock. Um, that day, and it was just a really wonderful end to our experience together. So some of the feedback from that last session, again, uh, the importance of that networking and support time, and also someone said the workshops gave me a voice. So that idea of not just imparting knowledge and education, but giving the scripts. What are the kinds of questions that you can ask? What are the things you can say when presented with a statement or issue from a staff member. They felt supported by the other family members that were there and they were starting to build those relationships with each other and really appreciated the suggestions. Again, around the areas for improvement, people felt like some people came every time and told the same story. So we need to think about the trauma of family members when they're coming into care homes, where they've been up to this point. Many of them have been caring for their relatives in the community. They have had a experiences in the hospital and now they're coming to the next place and they're coming in already traumatized so they feel like they need to tell the same story over and over again and having that validation of having their story heard. Um, some people talked about the need for tailored information based on their relationship with the resident that spouses and children need different kinds of information and based on their relationship. And then, of course, they wish that we'd keep going and that the workshop series would become a monthly thing. So that was the data that we collected over the ARC. We also did interviews with people um, in between each of the workshops, and I haven't included a lot of that data here. So then the post-workshop survey and debrief. So these were the results from the 11 family members who did not attend the workshop series. So reasons for non-attendance was mainly the time of the day. So if you remember back to that beginning group, about half of them were working full time. Obviously, it wasn't going to happen for them to come during the day. And so we lost a certain number of participants because of that choice. But on the other hand, a lot of the retired people said to us, we don't want to get out in the evening. It's dark. Transportation is challenging. So we had to make that decision. Um, but obviously, it was a time of day that didn't work for people. I think it's also important to note because you know, this affects the next part because things change for people as well. Um, as I said earlier, people aren't staying in care homes for as long as they used to. And from the course of the pre-survey going out in December, January, November, December, and January, until we did the workshops in April, four people's relatives had died. And four of their relatives had transferred to another facility or hospital. So that family, um, sort of presence in a facility changes fairly rapidly and so you don't have a lot of time with these people in order to have that impact through this type of intervention. Then also the post-survey results from the eight family members who attended the workshop. 
so um, in terms of how it affected their relationship with their relative, it was fairly equal in terms of the content of all the different workshops. But then in terms of how the workshops, how they felt it was most helpful for their relationship with staff, overwhelmingly it was the progression of dementia, the second workshop. And that was interesting to me because even though the majority of family members had identified that communication piece in the pre-survey as being the most important, it was the information about advanced dementia that became the most helpful. And I think that's because they then had the knowledge to be able to communicate more effectively. And so it wasn't just about the communication, it was knowing what they were talking about that was really the most helpful. And then in terms of some of the more open-ended um, and qualitative types of outcomes from those eight people, uh, it's important to note a couple of them, their relatives had also died. And so we weren't able to do the family importance versus family involvement scale again, because the numbers got so small, but we were able to collect some of this information. And so what was really hopeful for us was that six out of eight of the participants noticed a change in their involvement at the facility since the beginning of the workshop series. So for us, that was really what we had gone in wanting to accomplish. Most of them also created new connections with families. And two of them said that they met outside of the workshop time, which was great. And that's the other piece is that I think some people knew each other from other parts of their life, other places they'd been. And so this workshop series was really also an opportunity to continue to build those relationships outside of just passing each other in the hallways. It was also really encouraging that a couple of the family members talked about how they were able to shift their focus from, you know, sort of interacting with staff in a negative way around care to spending time there with their relative. So that was a really important piece for the people coming out at the other end of this workshop series. And then as family member um, in the upper right hand corner said, I found it helpful, very helpful to see how others have problems and solutions I didn't really know too much about. Comparing stories to my situation opened my eyes and provided ideas of what I should be doing. So that's the real richness of bringing the family members together around that peer support education networking to be able to think about how to engage in a different way. So those were the findings uh, from the actual intervention. I'm just gonna shift now into the methodological lessons learned. So the first point is, as any group of learners, family members are diverse. And going into this thinking, I'm presenting to a homogenous group, they're all family members of, Residents, this is going to be easy, one size fits all, is not a good way to go into it. <laughs> um, they all bring different learning styles, they all have different personalities, and they've all had different experiences. So really respecting that and listening to their feedback and making sure that we put on our educator hats as well, or have a good facilitator who can be flexible to the needs of all of those different styles and needs of participants. We definitely learned that it may have been better to have groups based on the family relationship um, or different times of days to accommodate people. As we sort of progressed, it was clear that um, the spouses certainly had areas of their rela spousal relationship they wanted to work on with their relative who lived in the care facility. And they were experiencing different type of losses and grief than the children were. And so respecting that and thinking about having different groups for different types of family members, I think uh, would have been helpful. Um, family members need different information at various points in their journey. So that goes back to the point where people were saying that first workshop, that would have been really helpful within the first six months. Uh, but for people who maybe were a year or two into that journey, they needed something very different. And so even targeting those different points in the caregiving continuum. And definitely the small sample size um, and participant group meant that we had to use different types of methods. So although this is an intervention, we really focus on qualitative research in terms of collecting our data. Um, we weren't able to do the survey or the measure, um, the instrument at the end because we simply didn't have enough people. So thinking about those things as researchers and you know what, what data collection methods fit with the study that I'm doing is really important. 
So just onto the discussion and implications. Um, contrary to some research and anecdotal information, family members do want to be involved. And I think that uh, there's a certain responsibility on the parts of facilities to figure out how to make that happen and make that work. I don't think that what we're doing right now works very well. I've done research around family councils as well. Uh, in Ontario, they probably are the most successful because they have some infrastructure support, but we don't necessarily see that in other places. And I think we need to shift our thinking about what does family engagement look like in this setting? And what can we create to help make that happen? Because I don't think that family councils are really hitting the mark there. I think that with some changes, maybe they could, but we do need a new model around family involvement and inclusion in care facilities. Uh, we still need more research, of course. Um, really need to consider ways that include and address the diversity of family needs and to develop capacity around family members to lead these kinds of workshops. We were getting there at the end, I think, of the third workshop. Um, so while the workshop development team members were family members, really were instrumental in determining the content and the flow of the workshops. For the first two workshops, they weren't really willing to co-lead the actual workshop. I think by the third workshop, we were there and one of the family members opened the workshop, uh, which was really wonderful. And I think that continuing to sort of um, foster that leadership in families, they would be able to take them over entirely. It was also important around that piece that um, one of the family members who stayed with us was someone who's spouse had passed away before the workshop series even started but they attended as part of their grieving process and by the end were able to start taking on that leadership role so i think also thinking that for some family members their identity that is tied to the facility doesn't necessarily end when their relative dies and so that was an opportunity for them to feel like they were contributing and helping other families uh, based on their experiences so I think there's definitely lots of room for growth there as well. So that's uh, the end of my formal presentation. And I'd just like to thank you for your time today. And I've included all my contact information there, uh, my email address, my Twitter handle, where I spend probably too much time. And we also have a Facebook page, Jero at UBC, where we post lots of news items around what's happening with our aging population within Canada and internationally, and I invite you all to engage with us on these different platforms. So thank you very much. I'll end it there. Great. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, I, we appreciate the all the work that you've done on this. Um, we do have some questions coming in, so uh, keep sending them in, but I'll start it off and ask you about what mechanisms currently exist uh, to facilitate family engagement in long-term care. and um, based on what's there, how do you think they can be improved? Um, like I said, I think that there's a few kind of moving pieces there. There's sort of the formalized family role in, in different provinces and territories, it works differently, but I'll speak to British Columbia. I think that we mainly have it sort of within our representative agreements around legal decision-making. We have some guidelines around family councils, around family involvement in care conferences. Uh, but there's this whole also invisible work of family members in this setting. I think that, um, you know, I'm always surprised. I've been working in long-term care for a long time and I've been uh, doing research and worked as a clinician and worked as a leader. And when I do my current studies and I say, you know, do you have a list, email list of family members? I, I, I get mailing lists. And I think one of the most valuable things that people can do is make that communication accessible. So I think about what we're doing today. We're doing a webinar. There's people from all over the country joining in. Um, but a lot of times when family members are invited to care conferences, they're told this is the time of your care conference. It's being determined according to the you know, availability of the staff. And we're just giving you the time and date and you need to be here in person. And we wonder then why family members don't engage very much, but I think a lot of it is around accessibility and we need to be shifting that to thinking outside the box, um, moving forward with technology that's available to be able to say, 
how do we create um, these structures and invest in them in a way that those family members feel like they are integral. They're not extra, they're not invisible, they are part of our community. So I think there's practical ways that we can do that that haven't really been attempted. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Kind of long yeah. and winding road. <laughs> no, that's great. Um, and uh, I do have a question also about um, whether or not you collected any qualitative feedback from the long-term care staff on the impact of this training um, and whether like specifically the staff noticed any sort of improvement in the uh, as staff caregiver collaboration or communication. We did not, we chose not to, um, in, to collect data with staff. Part of it was because this was a pilot study and we really wanted the focus to be on families. The other issues around building capacity and kind of getting to that critical mass of families who had participated in this in order for staff to see a difference. So that was a challenge because as you could see by the end, we had you know five family members who actually attended all those sessions. So in order to do that methodologically, we would have had to say to those family members, which staff do you interact with on the most regular basis and go and talk to those staff, which I suppose if I was doing this again, I might do. Um, because I think thinking through that piece, we didn't anticipate how much the group would shrink by the end. I think uh, informally and kind of anecdotally, certainly um, I know that several of the family members went to talk to the leadership in the facility because that was a door that we opened in one of the um in one of the sessions where we started to talk about you know it's not just that nurse who you meet as your team leader in your relatives unit but there is you know they have a supervisor and they have a supervisor and they have a supervisor so i know that there was at least one family member who said well i'm I'm calling that supervisor as soon as I leave this workshop and they did and that's where I was talking about at the beginning that um, definitely the leadership was very open to this project but um, no we did not formally collect any data with those staff next time <laughs> all right always more work to do um, exactly. <laughs> Um, there is a question here from someone who has done research on family councils um, and also believes that there's some unrecognized potential um, because many enabling factors are involved. Uh, so would it be possible for family councils to organize these types of facilitated participatory workshops themselves as a way of strengthening their roles in long-term care? So I'm going to answer that by putting a challenge out there to anybody who's online who lives, works, breathes in care facilities to say, give your family councils a budget to do this. I mean, it's easy to say, well, yeah, they could go do that. Absolutely, 100%, I think they could, but give them a budget. We shouldn't expect people to be doing things without giving them the proper resources. And I think that goes back to that first question. Um, and again, I think in Ontario with the Change Foundation, there's much more infrastructure around family councils. We need that across the country. I, I truly believe that we need to be having conferences of family councils. We need to be investing in it. So absolutely they could, but they need a budget. And, you know, they need to have a email address that's part of the email addresses of your network at your facility they need that formalized kind of presence they need that validation and you know they need to be able to you know use a webinar platform if they can they need to be connected to those clinical experts who can come in as speakers so yes they can and i would love to see that because i do think that's the vehicle that this should be happening in and that the rest of us should sit in the back seat and give them what they need to do it, um, support them in any way we can, but let those family members lead, absolutely. Great, thank you, that's a good point. Um, we have a question from someone who used to work in the long-term care as part of a recreation staff, um, and asks how you see the role of staff who are involved in recreation and taking on part of this workshop series as part of their mandate. That is a great question, I think that, um, therapeutic recreation is absolutely the center of most care facilities and care homes. Um, I think, uh, so 
one of the ways that the sort of person-centered care movement is shifting us is a way so from some more formalized aspects of um, therapeutic recreation in terms of at this time we're going to do this, at this time we're going to do that. So when I talked about those making moments meaningful pieces, you know, encouraging, talking to family members about what can you do with your relative, you know, the garden is in bloom, why don't you go for a walk, or including them as pseudo volunteers in different activities that are of interest to them. I'm sorry, I always have to get kind of auto ethnographic at this point and say, you know, my dad helped with the lawn bowling and my mom helped with the knitting at the facility where their moms live. So I think just even acknowledging them as people, using their names, saying, I've noticed you're here when we're doing this or that, would you like to join us? Some of them really would like their relative to be more involved in some of those activities. So helping them come together as a pair, helping to focus that time that they're together, that can be really powerful. Because um, again, some family members don't visit or spend time there because they don't know what to do. So targeting invitations to family members to say, hey, we're doing this. Why don't you come on in and join us for an hour with your relative to do this special art project or whatever it is. So finding those ways of really reaching out because I don't think people, many people don't feel comfortable in these settings. Many people have never stepped in a care facility until their relative lives there. And they really need that sort of boost to be able to do it. And I think that um, therapeutic recreation is the pathway for sure in terms of those linkages. Um, and helping people feel good about what's happening in that space. Great, thank you for that. And um, I do have a, a clarification that came in about the Ontario um, sort of structure. It's the Ontario Family Councils. Oh, sorry, yes. Our Family Councils Ontario, uh, not the Change Foundation that supports the Family Councils. So um, I guess there is support for councils through education, networking, and conferences, but I'm sure that um, depending on which province you're in, that that might uh, vary. So um, some might yes. need a little bit more of a boost than others. Thank you very much for that clarification. I apologize to everybody in Ontario for my mistake. But I just am a fan of the model you have there. I think that um, I would love to see it spread across the country. Great. Yes, for sure. And um, what about the role of technology um, in this? Have you uh, thought about uh, that or have taken on any sort of new collaborations with that? We haven't done it yet, but I think um, this is the way that you know, we need to be thinking. I, I do spend a lot of time sort of interacting with people who are in the patient engagement movement, and I think families are very much part of that too. Uh, so using technology, I mean, we all use Skype, we all use Zoom for business meetings, but we don't really do that when it comes to families. And like I said before, it seems like we're still using snail mail a lot of the time. I don't see very many facilities with a Facebook page. I don't see many facilities um, really out there on social media like Twitter. There's a couple and they're fantastic. Um, it really educating the public about what happens in these settings. So I think that what we need to do is think, how do we use technology otherwise in the world and why aren't we doing that with this group? The amount that we use our smartphones, but you know, don't have a WhatsApp or whatever. I've never done that before, but you know, using all of those tools that we have, to create those connections. Um, I think our lost opportunities and thinking that people, we only need to talk to people once a year at a, or twice a year at a care conference, you know, is not the way of the 21st century. And even things like electronic health records and having family members, um, you know, have access to their relatives electronic health record. And I, don't know the place that does that yet. So really pushing those boundaries. And I think long-term care is a sector that can do it. When I worked in long-term care 20 years ago, we had electronic health records for everybody. And we're just moving into that in many of our hospitals. So I think we can lead the way. And I don't think there should be boundaries on the creativity that we use. And asking family members, we always need to ask people, what can we do and how can we do it? We don't necessarily have the answers. Right, great. Um, and then just a closing comment here about um, that educational sessions and information notices could be more useful to family members 
Um, if it's posted uh, information like a video, pre video presentation on uh, the nursing homes websites and include include all the members in their sort of like work life schedule so they can view it at their uh, convenience. So uh, that's the last comment I have here. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, and Jennifer, if you don't have any last comments, um, I think what we'll do is we'll close it here. And if you have any further questions for Jennifer, uh, feel free to email her. Um, again, reminder to fill out the webinar uh, survey at, that's gonna show up right at the end. And I uh, hope to see you next time, uh, November the 27th at noon uh, Eastern for the next webinar. All right, thank you very much, Jennifer. Thank you all.